My name is Stephen Blockmans. I am a professor of EU External Relations Law and Governance at the University of Amsterdam. And I head the EU Foreign Policy Unit at the Center for European Policy Studies, CEPS, which is a think tank based in Brussels. So, so the idea for this uh, interregional cooperation initiative is, um, is to increase interregional cooperation um, between East Asia, Northeast Asia in particular, and, uh, and other regions. And of course, the European Union as well as ASEAN could play an important role in that, uh, in that respect in order to beef up not just economic governance, but also efforts of, uh, of increasing security throughout a wider region. Well, the, um, the low edge of the wedge is indeed to, uh, to find territories, policy areas where there is a commonality of interest and, uh, and an impetus for, uh, for political willingness to mature into concrete uh, cooperation um, in the field. I think here uh, what Korea and, uh, and partners in the, uh, in the Northeast Asia context could do is to look, of course, at the partners in the region, but also further beyond. Uh, you may have um, distant relatives in your family, uh, for example, in Europe, that are interested to, uh, to increase more general Asia-Europe um, cooperation, which has been embodied for many years, since 1996, in the ASEM, Asia-Europe um, Economic Meeting, which, of course, is developed along those lines in the economic field and uh, the Republic of Korea, of course, in 2000 hosted uh, the summit in, uh, and was chaired at the time by Nobel Peace Prize laureate uh, Kim Dae-yong, uh, very respected. I think there, there is still mileage in this, uh, in this awesome initiative, which is uh, maybe slipped uh, into, into the background a little bit not just in the economic front, but also to try and bring to the fore more non-traditional security mm -hmm. issues, which are of common interest. Uh, we are in Jeju, where uh, there is at the moment uh, a mini crisis around uh, refugees. Um, the flow of migrants and refugees is something which entertains uh, politicians and policymakers across uh, the globe. And of course, in an Asia-Europe context, this could uh, this could be emboldened, um, but it goes further than that in the areas of uh, fighting terrorism, in uh, piracy, and uh, and of course corruption more uh, more generally. These are areas which are politically sensitive, nonetheless, but which are not solely domestic and have an international, interregional um, uh, component, which could be addressed in. Uh, initiatives such as ASEM, and this is, as I mentioned, just one of the um, one of the efforts or avenues that um, that Korea and Northeast and Northeast Asia partners could look at. Right. So a lot of initiatives have indeed been created. We speak at a time when Jim Mathis is in Beijing, uh, trying to uh, research, of course, U.S. interests in uh, in the region and specifically with uh, with China. China has been very active. Um, in the South China Sea, the U.S. is trying to uh, to uh, curb that uh, increased power, of course, by keeping international maritime lanes open and insisting on uh, free freedom of navigation also throughout uh, the South China Sea. And it has developed a wider concept of Indo-Pacific uh, uh, cooperation, which centers around uh, economic and security uh, interests. Meanwhile, China has, as you mentioned in your question, taken inroads quite literally through uh, several silk routes into Central Asia um, as, well as, uh, as well as Europe. And I think here um, there are plenty of initiatives which are, uh, which are being uh, created which show that um, whilst multilateralism may have suffered as a result of an America first policy of Mr. Trump, which is translating, it seems, into an America alone uh, reality, mostly, where other um, actors are trying to, uh, to increase their interregionalism and cooperation. And China is certainly doing that by throwing its uh, economic weight around in big infrastructure projects also uh, in Europe. 
but um, rubbing up against structural differences which exist in uh, economic policy and which from the European side, which is a heavily institutionalized form of regulatory cooperation, of course uh, leads to insistence on screening of foreign direct, uh, direct investment, adherence to transparency in public procurement, competition law and, and state aid rules which ought to be observed. So you see a proliferation of all kinds of initiatives, um, also by the US in, in that uh, context, which give you an idea that whilst multilateralism may be under strain at the moment, interregionally is not waning. There are offshoots that could produce um, new forms of cooperation and hopefully set new rules also at the global scale. Right, I think first, as far as the US, Russia, China are concerned, of course, there are, there are regional as well as global powers and, um, and they have been supportive of uh, the different sides on the, uh, on the 38 uh, parallel. And in that sense, um, bear great responsibility at nudging both uh, parts on the Korean uh, peninsula closer to, get, uh, closer to a denuclearization uh, solution for the peninsula. Um, they again show differences in approach. And we've not only seen this in the sanction area, where China and Russia have been more accommodating to North Korean uh, concerns and uh, left channels open. Uh, we've also seen this on the, on the US side. And uh, of course, the, the grand overture that Mr. Trump made at the Singapore summit uh, with, uh, with the North Korean leader uh, suggests that normal ways, uh, certainly normal American ways of uh, diplomacy um, are being reinvented sometimes on the fly. This is not necessarily conducive, I think, to, uh, to a structural, durable uh, solution. And um, would, it would be wiser from that uh, point of view uh, to extract this issue from the, the several bilateral tracks on which um, North Korea seems to be moving, both with China, of course, in several, uh, in several occasions, with South Korea on a number of uh, occasions and uh, with the US. I think the world powers uh, would do well, and this brings in the European dimension, would do well in, in bringing this back into the fold of the UN uh, Security Council. A specific expertise which the European Union, as an organization above and beyond its individual member states who are part of the Security Council, can bring, is I think drawn from the Iran nuclear deal experience where the EU has been facilitating for more than a decade um, the talks which led to the JCPOA, the Iran nuclear deal, and which has been also supervising the, uh, as a monitoring body the implementation of the Iran nuclear deal. I think there might be elements, mm -hmm. um, not just to copy-paste um, uh, the model which has been used there, but there might be elements in both the procedural as well as the substantive uh, form of the Iran nuclear arrangements, which could be used for the uh, for the uh, denuclearization issue on the Korean Peninsula, and thereby bring in an EU expertise. Well, regionalism in itself, so stepping away from uh, interregionalism, uh, is suffering, um, you know, some strains as well. If we look at the European Union, of course, as a result of Brexit and the rise of populism in Central European countries as well as Italy, uh, you see that the integration momentum is somehow faltering. I, think, I, I do think, however, if you look a little deeper, that Brexit and the uh, refugee and migrant crisis, of course, all the violent conflicts on the, uh, on the eastern and the uh, southern front of the e European neighborhood, have resulted in a so-called integration dividend, which show that the European Union member states find that there is added value in working together at a higher level, that of the EU, in order to protect their own interests collectively. And so you see integration moves happening at the European Union, slowly but surely, as a result of Brexit, as a result of these crises in the field of uh, external border management and in an expeditionary sense, also the, uh, the beefing up of security and defense arrangements in Europe. 
regionalism in ASEAN, which is probably key towards any future um, inter-regional arrangement between Europe and Asia writ large, uh, has also suffered, I think, from the classic ASEAN way of doing things, which is premised on um, respect for sovereignty, rightly so, uh, non-interference into domestic affairs, but which has made this intergovernmental mode of functioning rather slow, albeit steady. I think um, there is room for improvement there, uh, there too. Um, and other forms of regionalism that we have seen in on the northeast, uh, the northeast Asian uh, side, they still have to come to full uh, fruition. So, looking at it around the world, it's maybe the area of Latin America, in fact, where you see most promising signs of regionalism uh, translating into concrete cooperative um, uh, action at the moment, and where you see um, a steeper learning curve and implementation curve than in other parts of, uh, of the world. I think the Forum has taken a very important role in promoting peace and prosperity uh, throughout the peninsula as well as uh, Asia writ large. And I think it should continue on this track because unfortunately the world has moved uh, in, a, in a direction which is more of contestation uh, rather than cooperation. So I think there's um, stay, the, stay the course would be my advice. Thank you very much for your attention and I hope to be contributing in the future.